Okay, we will re reconvene to public session at 923. Roll call, we have our student board member, Anthony is with us this morning, Mr. Buffalo is absent. Ms. Harvey, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, yes. please? Please stand and put your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do I have a motion to approve the uh, meeting agenda? So move. Second. Any discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we have no report out of closed session today, so we will move on to public comment announcement. Pursuant to board policy number 2350, Public comment may be limited to three minutes per person. All speakers who would like to comment regarding a matter on the meeting agenda must submit a public comment card to the board president or recording secretary prior to the point in the meeting at which the agenda item is called. All speakers who would like to comment regarding a matter not on the meeting agenda must submit a public comment card to the board president or recording secretary prior to the point in the meeting for open forum or non, on non-agenda items. Public comment cards are available at the information table at the rear of the boardroom from the recording secretary or online. And we have two. Uh, first person I would like to call is Dr. Jason Bowen. Uh, good morning, Board of Trustees. Uh, Trustee Harvey, uh, welcome back. It's great to see you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, President Zillette, uh Patty McCurr, and whoever else may be listening. I uh, gave exams this week in my physics courses, so I teach three physics courses, and my exa exams are timed. Uh, however, though they're timed, in most of my courses, I always allow a couple of minutes after the exam officially ends uh, to give students a few minutes to complete their calculations. Last night, and, and at the end of the exam, there's normally maybe five or six students who were finishing up calculations. So this has been a standard practice my entire career. Last night, most of the students finished fairly early. However, there was a single student who worked to the very end. And I'm counting down. I said, you know, five minutes remaining, three minutes remaining, one minute remaining, 30 seconds remaining. And when I said 30 seconds remaining, uh, you know, he brought his exam up to the, to the front desk. I don't know why I asked this question. However, I asked him when he was walking up to the front desk. I said, so were you able to answer all of the questions? I didn't anticipate what he would say. I was, he said, no, I did not. And I said, well, what happened? And so he showed me the word problem, and he had a formula that he had derived and all he needed to do was plug in the numbers into that formula to complete the calculation. So standard practice, I said, okay, well, you have a couple of minutes. Please go finish uh, the, the, the problem and complete the calculation. So he took a minute or two, which students normally do, and he turned his exam in. And I was at the front, so he handed me his exam. This was last night. And I said, so you got it all done. And he looked at me, and he said, Thank you. And then he then that was the end of the the night. Um, I think back to why I asked the question to begin with. I asked the question because I care about his education. I asked the question because I care about ensuring that he has everything he needs uh, to to do his best. Now I share that story because I do not believe that the administration is doing everything in their power to ensure that employees have everything they need to do their jobs. The environment remains punitive. 
uh, morale among some faculty is low. I think that the solution lies in reform, uh, changing the attitude. In my opinion, the general counsel's office, the leadership in human resources, and these are operating uh, with Gen President Jennifer Zillette's support. I think that what they need to do is create an environment where we can do the best that we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowen. Okay. Oh. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Cindy Hedricks. Good morning. I could have given Jason some of my time. Um, Payment for services rendered is just a basic tenant of employer-employee relationships. So I'm glad that the district decided to pay people for their work done for the poker and zero textbook cost conversions. Um, however, there are still employees that have completed work that are not getting paid. Uh, you don't negotiate after the work is done and then say we're going to think about paying you. So I hope everyone that has completed work, any supplemental services will be paid for the by the district in a timely manner. People are counting on that money. Um, and again, that would help to increase morale. So back to what Dr. Bowen said. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, presentations. Our first presentation is Title IX update, and uh, we'll call on Vice President Houseford. Patty, can I have the PowerPoint? Good morning, Board of Trustees, Dr. Zellett, and colleagues. I stand before you this morning to talk about Title IX reporting requirements responsi and responsibilities. As um, you all know, Title IX has been a hot topic of conversation within the institution of higher education landscape since for, for years, but uh, most recently since 2011. Okay, I'm a little shorter than the other people. <laughs> since 2011 with the Dear Colleague uh, letter. So um, Title IX is an area, one of the areas of my expertise, and so I'm often called upon by other colleges for insight, and so I share some of what I know with you this morning. So, so before we get started, I think it's important to uh, explain what these 50-ish words are that uh, dry, are our driving force. So the federal regulations of Title IX say that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So we are bound by this uh, federal legislation as we receive uh, a lot of federal funds in the form of financial aid for our students, grants, um, most of our dollars come from uh, federal funds, and so we must comply with this uh, legislation. Title IX also, there are other uh, forms of legislation that impact and are closely related to Title IX. So the first one is the Cleary Act, um, and the Cleary Act uh, governs schools' response to domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and other crimes, and requires that we uh, publish uh, crimes of sexual nature as well as violent crimes such as uh, murder or robbery uh, that happen within our general vicinity. And there um, are demarcations as to how far across our uh, campus that we go, as well as campus-owned properties um, within uh, off, off of our campus. So like Fox Field, it's not in our campus, but that is in our Cleary jurisdiction, right? And so it ends with the requirement to publish a daily crime stat and an annual uh, security report, which is due every October 1st. Uh, and it was posted on October 1st on our sheriff's website, so I encourage everybody to take a look at that. That was a lot of work done by many folks in my office, and I'm appreciative of all they've done. 
the other legislation that clo tightly closed to this is VAWA, which is the Violence uh, Against Women Authorization Act, and it has been reauthorized a handful of times, and it requires prompt and fair impartial uh, investigations, notices regarding when um, investigations are taking place uh, for sexual misconduct or similar allegations, as well as timelines uh, for these processes to occur. So all this ties into our Title IX landscape. So where are we today? Uh, Title IX is uh, 50 years old, 50, 51 now. Um, but there's been a lot since 2011 reinvigorating the talk, right? A lot of times when you hear Title IX, you think a gender equity in sport, but Title IX is a lot more than that. So uh, in May of 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, the Office for Civil Rights, who was charged with overseeing Title IX, launched uh, or retooled our framework. And so they required implementation with the new regs by August 14th of 2020. And this was the fir first time that the Title IX regulations were, were legally binding. Up until this point, up until 2020, they were suggestions um, or recommendations, but in 2020, they became legally binding. It also extended Title IX protections to faculty and staff. So now more than just our students are covered. Um, this was done uh, under former President Trump and former Educa Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos. And so there is a pendulum switch. Uh, I, and so uh, President Biden and his administration has signaled that they are going to be changing the legislation. And it was supposed to be released in May 23. It's now October 23. It was supposed to be released now, it's not, so your guess is as good as mine, but um, there are new regs coming. So why am I, as the VP of HR, standing in front of you today having this discussion? Well, HR is essentially the district civil rights office. I am charged, or we are charged, with ensuring compliance with all federal and state laws uh, regarding the protection of harassment and discrimination. So that's how we fit into the mix here. Regarding Title IX, the federal legislation covers these five colored squares. Uh, so it's sexual harassment, sexual assault, dating and domestic violence, and stalking, as well as retaliation for reporting or, uh, any, or participating in an investigation. That is it. That's all the legislation covers regarding what is Title IX misconduct. So our current process, and again, this goes back to 2020 with the, those regs, is that at some point the district becomes on notice that there is a concern or an allegation of protected class or sexual misconduct. And I'll talk to you in a moment about when we are on notice. Um, then folks are invited to file a formal complaint, or as the Title IX coordinator, I can file one, or the other coordinator, Adanya, can file one as well. And then we will launch an investigation which could end in either an alternate resolution and or a live hearing, uh, which I'll talk to you in a moment about as well. And then finally, once the decision is rendered, all parties have appellate rights. So I went uh, a moment ago, I showed you those four color or five colored boxes, which are the federal definitions of sexual misconduct. But we all know that sexual misconduct is more than that, right? So listed on the slide here, you see other things, video or audio taping sexual activity without consent of all partners, uh, disseminating sexual photos, videos without the consent of all folks involved in the photos, right? Uh, exposing oneself, voyeurism. All those things aren't covered under Title IX because the definition is very specific. However, there's still not acceptable <laughs> and appropriate um, actions that we accept in our community, right? So we have the district has a separate process for non-Title IX sexual sexual misconduct, right? So it has to go through a different process, but it is still not acceptable. So essentially to determine if something was is a violation of a sexual misconduct code, we need to ask ourselves, was the act sexual in nature? And if so, was it non-consensual? And then if so, there is probably some policy violation um, and some action that we can take as a district. Uh, we also, in my office, oversee per, uh, investigations of protected class misconduct. And so listed on the slide are the 20-ish protected classes. And these are based on um, the federal and state definitions of protected class. So there can be no sort of harassment or discrimination on, in any one of these categories. So what happens when there's a uh, concern of sexual misconduct or protected class misconduct? Um, 
we have a duty of care to all parties as the Title IX coordinator. We uh, have services and supportive measures that are available to all parties regardless of their affiliation. Uh, respondents, reporting parties, witnesses, and these in, uh, supportive measures are designed to ensure that all folks can properly and fully engage in the district and all, bene uh, all of our benefits. So that can include things like avoidance of contact, switching of schedules, relocation of offices, whatever is needed to make sure that everybody can fully engage. We cannot, however, take action against a respondent without there being due process. And due process would mean an investigation and a finding that he, she, they are res found responsible to have violated our policy. Um, and so there's a lot we can do to beef up the supportive measures about, around somebody who has been negatively impacted, but we have to do due process in order to take action against a respondent. So at the beginning I said, when are we on notice as a district, right? And so the federal Title IX regs say that there are officials with authority. And once an official with an authority um, has actual or suspected knowledge of an instance of sexual or protected class misconduct, they are required to let the Title IX coordinator know. And so officials with authority at AVC have been identified as Dr. Zellett, uh, Bridget, all vice presidents, deans, associate deans, executive directors, directors, managers, supervisors, and coaches. So if any one of these folks becomes aware, they are required to let myself or VP Padron know immediately. Everybody else is a responsible employee and it is best practice for them to report to us because all we're doing is giving the folks information regarding their rights and resources, but they are not required to do so. However, we live in California and uh, enter SB 493, which is California's response to Title IX. This became effective in January of 22, and it expanded our definition of what an official with authority is, who was mandated to let us know. And so now it expands to cover resident assistants. We don't have residence halls here, but we do have student workers. So it would cover some student workers as they are interacting with other students, right? Student life directors, coordinators, deans, athletic directors, coordinators, deans, coaches of any athletic or academic team or activity, faculty, associate faculty, instructors, lecturers, uh, grad students, lab directors, coordinators, internship directors, and study abroad programs. So essentially, it covers most of our employees uh, are required to report any actual or suspected misconduct. So once somebody is aware, they are to report it to either Dania or myself. We do, inform we do outreach in with uh, information regarding rights, resources, and reporting mechanisms, and provide private and confidential options for folks as well. And then the, the um, impacted individu individuals in the driver's seat as to how they would like to move forward. Title IX also covers pregnancy, parenting, and uh, pregnancy and parenting. So um, for students, for student athletes, and for employees as well. So if anyone is aware of somebody who is uh, pregnant or um, dealing with any of the pre or post pregnancy. Uh, conditions, they should refer us, uh, refer them to our office. We can provide modifications and accommodations, and, but we cannot ask any, my office can ask for medical documentation, other folks cannot. We cannot change requirements of a activity for somebody who is expecting, who is pregnant, um, and we can only advise the person of the risk of participating in said lab, of participating in said sport activity on the potential uh, pregnant individual and fetus. We cannot make them sign a waiver um, or um, unless we make all folks who participate sign a waiver, right? So we can just educate folks about their rights. And we cannot pen uh, penalize folks who restrict their activities because of their pregnancy status or ask about the implications about when they return should they take a leave. So what we have here is um, we can do accommodations. Um, you know, maybe somebody needs a special desk with a growing belly. Um, maybe uh, we can alert their professor that they have extended doctor's appointments. Uh, we do trainings for employees. And we also have breast, chest feeding um, or, uh, spaces throughout campus uh, for folks. Um, and we provide that information upon request. We also have, uh, Tritalin also covers transgender non-binary folks. So um, at AVC, folks are able to use 
uh, the restroom that most closely matches their gender identity. They are free to fully engage in an environment without ha harassment. They can be, uh, they will be referred to by their chosen slash preferred name and uh, gender pronouns. And so they can uh, come to our office and we can help assist them with those accommodations. So um, moving forward, what we are doing here at AVC is uh, standard outreach and intentional modalities, right? OCR has been very clear about how they expect us to deliver information to folks who have been impacted by Title IX. And so we are standardizing those processes and keeping a database so we have all uh, information. Um, we are seeing increased reporting. And let me tell you, increased reporting is not a bad thing because that means people know where to go and how to get support. So I actually get very happy happy when I see rec increased reporting because the incidents are happening, but now people just know how to get the support. Um, uh, I worked with um, folks in OSD and uh, we drafted a syllabus statement informing students of their rights, resources, and how to get accommodations. And so that was sent out to faculty before the fall semester and it is on a lot of uh, syllabi throughout the campus. And we are working on a Title IX website. Uh, we also, in compliance with requirements, are going through a series of trainings, purchased the rights to the film Red Roll, Roll Red Roll, which is an expose on a sexual assault that happened on a high school team uh, in Steubenville, Ohio. And so I've uh, been going around and training uh, a bunch of folks. I trained all the employees in athletics and kinesiology. I had open sessions during Flex Week. Uh, we trained the Learning Center student services and equity teams, and I'm going to be training admin council as well to ensure that everybody knows about their requirements. Uh, finally, effective uh, September of 24, we have AB 2683, which uh, expands uh, training requirements for students. And so now all students within the first six months of attendance at your school are going to be required to have some sort of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct training. So um, we will, it, they're not very specific as to what it looks like or the modality. And so we are engaging in those conversations. So. What's next for Title IX? I don't know. <laughs> um, let's see what uh, DC says soon. Um, but I do know that we are in California and with um, post um, Doe v. Alley regulations in our, in our Supreme Court here in California, the Ninth Circuit has been very clear that live hearings are here to stay. Um, and so there will be cross-examination and the need for outside facilitators to come in and serve as decision makers. Um, and so even if the regs switch uh, in federally, we are still then have to defer to our state regulations, which are more uh, protective uh, in terms of ensuring that there is cross-examination. So thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to entertain any questions, comments, or concerns. Uh, I have one question. Um, does Title IX cover women's sports, or is that another title? Mm, it covers it's uh, covers women's sports. So it's uh, it prohibits harassment or discrimination based on sex and gender in all forms. So that includes athletics. That's why pregnancy is covered, uh, breast or chest feeding. So yes, it covers women's sport as well. Okay. Thank you for the handout. Thank you. A construction update, Vice President Barr. Barr. Good morning, President Zellett, Board of Trustees, student board member. Today I'm presenting a construction update on Measure AV Capital Projects. Beginning with recently completed projects, Discovery Lab is a 35,000 square foot technical education facility that supports welding, fire technology, electronics program, and avionics. The building is complete and we are in closeout. The new two-story 58,000 square foot student services building is complete and occupied. It was a great feeling to see the building fully occupied near max capacity during the first week of classes. Um, it's a one-stop shop with many of our private primary student services being provided there. Um, we're finalizing closeout documents with contractors. Infrastructure and photovoltaic uh, relocation includes various infrastructure and utility upgrade projects throughout campus. The intersection and the bus stop projects are complete, and we're working on fiber installations on the blue phones. 
The Marauder Complex provides 22,000 square feet of usable space at the Marauder Stadium. Uh, it includes a team locker room, restrooms, training space, laundry equipment, and meeting and office space. Both phases of the project are now complete and the final modular is occupied. Landscape work is continuing and the project is in closeout. Swing Space 2 added additional classrooms and office space to support demolition work. It's substantially complete. All areas are occupied or they were occupied at the beginning of the semester. We're now working on closeout documents for that as well. And moving on to current projects, uh, the, the most exciting project right now is Cedar Hall. It's a three-story, 65,000 square foot, a state-of-the-art building that'll house classrooms, faculty offices, it'll have an art gallery, and a dedicated boardroom. Structural steel is in place and work is continuing on schedule for completion in March of 2025. Upcoming is the Commons. It's a 47,000 single-story building which will be the core of student life and college activities. It'll include a full kitchen, dining facilities, spaces for student groups. Uh, architectural plans are being updated to accommodate programming changes. We expect to go out to bid in January of 24 and expect completion in March of 26. Shown here are our completed projects. We move these to the end of the presentation since, since we go through these quite frequently. We have Palmdale Center here that was completed in March of 2018, Swing Space One. Campus Security, the new building completed and occupied in April of 22. Sage Hall completed in December of 21. The Outdoor Fitness Center completed in October of 22. Um, and those are the completed projects there. And then looking ahead, we look ahead to continued construction for Cedar Hall, um, as well as the Commons. We're looking forward to a facility service plan and a su sustainability plan that'll be a part of that service plan. That work will get underway in the next month or so. And then finally, the gym renovation project um, was, was shelved and we are looking to the state for additional funding for a gym replacement project, or we are looking for additional funding sources. Okay. Any questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, have we used up all of the AV bond measure funds? They are all allocated. We have not used them all. There is one issuance remaining, um, but they are obligated and allocated. So on these other projects, it would be contingent on state funding if they proceed, is that correct? The, you mean the gym replacement? Well, whatever in the future, because we're, we've used up the AV so, bond, we'll have to use the state funds? For so the all of the projects that I mentioned, with the exception of the gym replacement, will all be funded for Measure AV. Okay, thank you. Shami, I just have a quick question. Um, do we have any estimate, and it would simply be an estimate, what the cost would be to replace that gym? Our estimates have ranged from 40 to $45 million. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, board members, uh, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Any second? I need a second. Yes, um, yes Madam President, I'd like to discuss. Uh, well, I don't have a second yet, Mr. Uh, Mr. Reeves. I'll second, I'll second. Thank you. That's. That might be a first for you. Wonderful. Um, okay. A any discussion? Yes. Um, 12.6 and 12.11. On 12.6, uh, this is our travel authorization. Um, I see that there was one expenditure for $4,000 to a conference in Maryland. And the other expenditures for that same uh, trip were not as high. I'm, I'm just concerned about these travel expenses being so high. So that's my comment on that. Uh, the other is the 
12.11 is approval of board policy 5130 about financial aid. And the new policy reads that the president superintendent, well, I, I believe that it should say the president superintendent and the board of trustees uh, in that uh, policy. And because it does reduce the grants uh, for California Dream, prohibits the grants being reduced for California Dreams uh, students. And uh, I just think that the Board of Trustees should be uh, on that with the, should read the President, Superintendent, and the Board of Trustees. That's just my saying. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Action items 13.1, approval of resolution number 23-24 slash two, election to become subject to the Uniform Public Construction Cost Accounting Act, delegation of authority to superintendent slash president to take for emergency actions without bidding. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Madam President, I have a uh, question uh, about this. Um, could the Vice President tell me um, how much the President can spend without board authority? I know that some boards give uh, the CEO, the President's authority to spend so much money. Do you know how much that we give uh, President-elect to spend without board authorization? Sir, this is board authorization. But I so mean, I don't, I never spend money without board authorization. Implied in the delegation of authority in BP 2230, I'm trying to remember the one it is, 2040, there, there's a delegation of authority to the president from the board of trustees. So I never spend or act without board authority. So uh, unlike some boards that say to the CEO, you can spend $200,000 without our authorization. You're not in that category. Is that correct? I'm not sure what your question is. Sir. Well, I, yeah. you're asking, do I spend without board authority? The answer is categorically no. No, that's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not clear, but some boards give the CEOs, okay, you could spend up to 200000 so to speak, without coming to us, the board. You have that prerogative. So this, this item is specifically about declaring emergency conditions, particularly what happened in the wake of Hurricane Hillary and us having to vacate two spaces on campus. In order to work expeditiously and to work with our insurance company, we had to declare that this is an emergency situation and it allows us to behave in a different kind of manner. We can work expeditiously, we mm -hmm. can work with our insurance companies, we can work with other contractors without having to go through the traditional three bid process, which would turn what is already coming into a multi-month uh, process into a year long process, which we're, um, it, it doesn't have to be given the circumstances. Okay. So that's the nature of, of this agenda. I, item, I understand sir. that, but I was trying to ascertain whether, for example, if they came to you and we got to spend $100,000 for the floors, did you already have authority to spend up to a certain limit as college president? That was the thing. Apparently, we did, we did not give you that authority. I was just trying to ascertain whether you had that authority. Do you see what I'm talking about, uh, President? Okay. I just want to say that the, I believe recently Trustee Reed restated the limit to the amount of the president. Right. Right. And, uh, and different allocations such uh -huh. as that and what those limits were. And we can go back to that. Yeah. Because well, I do remember what okay. you're talking about. Well, in this specific case, as you mentioned, it's the renovation of the administration building because of damage. And it will involve millions of dollars. And does this mean that you can 
uh, bid out millions of dollars without board authorization. Trustee Reeves, the president has uh, authority to spend up to $50,000 okay, prior to board you. approval. Thank prior you very to, much. But everything That's what comes I know. back to the board. So she could, she could do some things with that building right now with that $50,000, you know. Up to 50000 the president can approve, but then it, it still does come back. Yeah, but if it's, if it's going to be more, which it is, right. then uh, she wants the authority to do that without bidding. And I'm not too crazy about that because the, the cost of materials and stuff has gone up. We're talking could be a couple million bucks on that thing. And I would, and the board knows about. If I, if I can, sir, it's, it's yeah. really, it's not about bidding. We are working with um, our with Keenan and our insurance. So the the objective here isn't to bypass any process, any board policy. The objective here is to get the work done, work with our insurance and, and our mitigation company that the insurance recommended to us that they work with. So it is just to expedite and get that response to the storm and get that work completed so that that building can be occupied. I feel what you're saying. Um, I was two foot schools in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Right. And I think what Mr. Barr is speaking to is if a hurricane comes through and if they tear the roofs off of these buildings, mm -hmm. you won't have time to get a bid. There are certain things that you'll need to take care of to protect the infrastructure of the building, mm -hmm. the electrical system, all of those things, and you may not have time in emergency to go out to bid. So, but one thing we do know in our service here since 2020 is that nothing expensive is purchased or ascertained by this college without board approval. So, um, well, I just uh, am wary about this because of the potential for millions of dollars. We're not talking about hundreds of thousands, we're talking millions to renovate the building. But anyway, I appreciate uh, your feedback, Mr. Vice President, and it's no reflection on our president if I vote no on this. Thank you. Mr. Reeves, I just also want to add that I think the key words there were, is that our, our uh, president is working with the insurance company. And one thing I can guarantee you is the cost of construction is not going to be any cheaper uh, a month from now than it is today. Uh, construction costs are going up uh, weekly. So I think that um, as our president, yes, she should have the right to, in working with the insurance company, to take action so as to um, uh, pursue the project and get the, the project completed. Okay. Do I have advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Opposed. 13.3, approval of amendment to our professional services agreement between McDougal. 13.2? Yeah, two. I'm sorry. 13.2, approval of resolution number 23-24 slash three of the Board of Trustees regarding compensation for absence member of the Board of Trustees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Um, any discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Thank you. 13.3, uh, approval of amendment to our professional services agreement between McDougal, Bomer, Foley, Lyon, Mitchell, and Erickson, a professional corporation, and Antelope Valley Community College Antelope Valley Community College to add legal services for Title IX live hearing decision making. And we have one um, public uh, comment on this, Dr. Bowen. Thank you and good morning again. Uh, I understand that uh, McDonald, Bomer, Foley, Lyon, Mitchell, and Erickson uh, were originally contracted in the amount of $5,000 to provide training for Title IX. Uh, this particular agenda item extends or amends that contract to $50,000 to now provide services for hearings, et cetera, when, and, and so my concern is we have a general counsel's office and a human resources 
a vice president and an interim director of human resources, and yet we are still reliant on uh, third parties to provide uh, these types of services, uh, which begs the question, uh, do we need an office of general counsel? Now, it's my understanding that uh, single college districts in California, it's actually rare for a single college district to have a general counsel's office. This is not uh, too uncommon for the multi uh, college districts. However, I believe that, you know, my hope is that we take a look at redundancies and whether or not we need that office. So, for example, in the next reorganization, it might be a good idea to consider eliminating that office altogether. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, uh, Madam President. Uh, the 50000 seems like it's a retainer for this law firm, or we can use up to the 50000 uh, I would prefer, if we have to use this law firm, that we do it on a per-item basis and uh, pay them as uh, the services are, are needed and have the board approve it. I don't uh, approve giving them $50,000, up to $50,000 to spend. So I prefer it to be individually. So I'm going to vote no. Sir, for your information, um, it is paid on a services rendered basis. This is not a $50,000 check written to an institution, and then we'll just use up that $50,000. As we need those services, those services are rendered, they are billed, and they are paid for. Well, uh, they can come up to the board each time those services are used, and we can okay the services on a per item basis. We don't and have to have a, a $50,000 check for them to deduct down it. This is true. And if the board wishes to conduct business that way, it would mean that um, sensitive employee investigations get uh, delayed as we wait month to month for board approval on a single item basis. And so, um, it's the board's choice how they wish to do business. Well, uh, the board does uh, usually approve uh, financial tra transactions of a college. I, I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, law firms uh, take a long time to bill anyway. Uh, so I'm going to vote no. Any more discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. No. 13.4, approval of academic policies and procedures, APNP committee's recommendations, of course, listing. Do I have a motion? So Second. Any discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 13.5, approval of Associated Student Organization, ASO, annual budget for academic year 20. 23-2024. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 13.6. Approval of amendment of the agreement with timely care telehealth services for students from October 13th, 2023 through October 12, 2024. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. 13.7, approval of a me of memorandum of understanding between Baby to Baby and Antelope Valley Community College District to provide donated items to students who have dependent children. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 13.8, approval of agreement between Shabbat Las Positas Community College and Antelope Valley Community College for the California Early Childhood Mentor Program from July 1st, 2023 through July 30th, 2024. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 13.9, approval of California State University Baker, Bakersfield Pathways of Possibilities for Transforming Higher Education Curriculum Alignment Program, CSUB, POP the CAP, grant budget proposal. Do I have a motion? 
So moved. Second. Any discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 13.10, uh, approval of cooperative agreement between the Regents of the University of California and Antelope Valley College on behalf of the UC Berkeley Center of Educational Partnerships Fuente Project. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 13.11, approval of service agreement with Life Signs, now D DBA Life Signs Incorporated, to provide sign language interpreting services for deaf students, faculty, and community members. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Madam President. Um, I would like to say something about this. Um, one of the community colleges in the state offers a program in uh, deaf interpretation. I, I realize that uh, the community colleges can't duplicate what the state uh, is offering, like Cal State Northridge offers a deaf studies program where they teach signing and so forth. Uh, but I think, and I brought this up before with the past president, I wish that we could, like another community college, offer a bachelor's degree program uh, in uh, sign language interpreting at this institution. Thank you. I just want to add to that, although we do not have a bachelor's program, we do have a phenomenal um, deaf, and deaf studies program here at uh, Antelope Valley Community College. Okay. Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, 13.12, approval of lecturer agreement between Dolores Huerta, AAE Holdings Incorporated, and Antelope Valley College for Speaking Services. So and we have two speakers on this. So um, I'd like to call up Ms. Pamela Ford. Good morning, board members, uh, President Zealot, and guests. Um, welcome back, Ms. Harvey. Uh, once again, I'm pleased to see the district is moving forward with using equity funds properly by bringing another speaker, Dolores Huerta, to speak words of strength and to address experience significant to people of color from her perspective. I believe this will be enlightening and informative to students, staff, faculty, administrators, and the community as a whole. This is another positive step towards diversity, inclusion, equity, inclusion, and access. By no means is such a speaker only beneficial to people of color. This is a growth experience for individuals of all groups. To gain understanding of one another as a people is to inspire growth. I hope this continues. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bowen. It's always difficult following Ms. Pamela Ford. Uh, you know, I attended the, the event yesterday with uh, Angela Davis, and I thought that uh, President Zillette did a really great job uh, moderating, and I was deeply affected listening to her, and most importantly, seeing her in person walk across the stage. And I was stunned at the end when I saw the large number of students. We had to cut questions short, but there are a large number of students who, who stood in line to ask her questions. And her history goes back decades. I asked my, uh, one of my physics classes, uh, 23 students were present in that class. And I asked them, you know, we're talking, and I asked, you know, have, has anyone seen The Matrix? And none of them had seen The Matrix. So I thought, wow, that, well, for me, it seems like I just watched that movie yesterday, but for the first time. But you know, you have Angela Davis who, who visits, and she has this history that goes back all these decades, and that history is so important to all of these students. So I think that 
you know, going forward, I mean, my understanding is that President Zillette is has uh, expressed considerable support for bringing speakers of this caliber to our college, and I just want to say thank you for that. And I'm looking forward to seeing the additional gifts given. And one other effect I want to highlight is uh, what I think it also provides, because I was listening to students talk outside in line yesterday when we were in line to get our, our book signed, is that it, it establishes a considerable reservoir of pride uh, for their journey, uh, for being here, and so they visit Antelope Valley College, they attend uh, the college and take courses, and they know that this is a special place that's going to provide them with the resources necessary to excel and achieve their dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowen. All right, do I have a motion? Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Madam President. Um, I wonder if the Vice President can tell me uh, how much money we have in the student equity fund that would uh, fund this uh, speaker. You know? It's the, the allocation to the college for various and sundry purposes through the state equity uh, allocation of $6.5 million. Wrapped up in that are, are personnel um, and other programmatic things, but it, that's the fund through which it comes. So we submit the bill to the state, is that correct? The state gives allocations to the colleges, and the colleges account for the monies that yeah, are Yeah, but how much of, do, we, to, do we have? How much do we have? The, the allocation, sir, it, we, could, we could set a, an appointment and have a discussion about this. The allocation to the college, mm -hmm. $6.5 million. So uh, for forever, forever, I mean. It's on an annual basis, and it's, there are factors involved in the calculation. So is that only for speakers or other activities? We submit a student equity and achievement plan every year, and part of the, the we spend according to the plan. And so the plan um, is, is based on several factors. It's, it's based on um, developing our cultural competence as an institution. It's based on giving uh, these cultural growth opportunities mm -hmm. and, and after affirmative opportunities to our students. It's based on professional development for faculty, classified professionals and administrators, mm -hmm. on growth mindset, cultural competence, um, uh, Im embedding all of these best practices into their classrooms, and even administrators being trained on how to enact equitable practices and make sure that equity is at the core of all we do. So it's an allocation of money that the college is granted on an annual basis to spend according to not only your uh, your equity plan, student equity and achievement plans that, that's submitted to the state on an annual basis, but also um, there are spending guidelines. So every expenditure must fit within those guidelines. And I could I could make that available to you for your perusal. Um, does that in, uh, include classes, offering classes? We cannot, we cannot pay for classes. We can, um, we can have a, we, okay. I can talk to you about the, oh, I can send okay. you the guidelines. And, and yeah, I just want to say, uh, I'm a great admirer of uh, Dolores. Uh, she fought for the working people of California, the people that grow our food, and other people in the labor movement. She's a great person. Uh, I think the president and I had an opportunity to see her at that uh, conference of Central American celebration, I, you know, I can't remember the title of it, but she was there, and I, I was supposed they didn't pay her $44,000 to appear. I don't mind having speakers on campus and, and defraying some of their expenses, but I, I object to spending 50000 and 44000 because it's going to a speaker bureau, too. The speaker bureau that handles these speeches uh, getting a cut out of this. It's not going directly to the speaker. So uh, even though, you know, I'm a great admirer of Dolores, I'm going to vote no. Um, I have a comment. <clears throat> um, I think right now in um, just history, there are iconic people that are still with us. 
And I am just very proud of you, Dr. Gillette, to recognize that and to uh, invite Ms. Harrod to hear. Um, these things are very important for our youth. So thank you. And I would just like to say that um, I, I'm just supporting the great work being done on campus. These, these suggestions are originating from the people who are doing the equity work on campus. And so thank you for the kudos and I'm gonna pass it on to those who deserve them. Okay, uh, any more discussion? Advice? I approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Um, excuse me, Madam President. Yes. Uh, due to my class schedule, I need to leave right now. Thank you. School is always special. Good luck in your finals. Midterms. 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 That's right. Well, I've We're jumped ahead eight weeks, haven't yeah. I? Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, 13.13. 13. Approval of professional service agreement with High Desert Auction to handle obsolete equipment auction. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Advice? It's not here, so all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. 13.14, approval to dispose of surplus obsolete supplies and equipment. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. 13.15, approval of agreement between Outfront Media Incorporated and Antelope Valley Community College to provide freeway billboard advertising in support of marketing enrollment efforts. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Madam President. Um, the Valley Press yesterday had an article uh, about us voting on this uh, billboard and they equated it with enrollment. Now I've asked the, uh, the college to try to find out uh, how students, new students learned about the college, from the newspaper, word of mouth, billboards, bus boards, whatever. I've never gotten a reply on that. Um, and they, they're equating, apparently in this article, that the enrollment uh, justifies, the enjoy, justifies this billboard. Well, if you're going northbound on the 14, just before you go over the hump, go into the Palmdale area, you see the billboard on your left for ABC, which you can't read. The print is small, it's not legible. It's on the wrong side of the road. So are we gonna pay $58,000 for a billboard you can't really see or understand from the freeway? Thank you. Uh, I have a question, Dr. Salad, has enrollment increased? Yes, ma'am, it has. Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No. 13.16, approval of data sharing usage agreement between California State University, Northridge, and Antelope Valley College. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 13.17, approval of five-year renewal agreement with EduNav Incorporated for degree audit and educational Planning Tools subscription. We have uh, Okay. And that person is May Sanicola. Good morning, everyone. It's Mesa Nicolas. Mesa Nicolas. Is this that where you can make your meetings? Well, do, you have a total of 30 minutes for this, so if you can, uh, I don't think there's quite 10 comments here, so let's, if we can just read through them, we'll just take all the comments. Sure. sure. Okay, this is from Angie Gonzalez. Um, I would not like for EduNav contract to be renewed. I've seen students enrolled in incorrect classes due to this tool, and I think we should look at other planning tools. Um, and these are all counselors uh, that represent counseling and matriculation. 
Devin Mosley, as a counsel counseling faculty member who has used the software, I request the board to reevaluate a contract renewal of Edronav and consider alternative options. Griselda Rodriguez, I wish to vote against extending the Edgenav contract. I believe this is a user-friendly tool when it comes to creating education plans for local degrees and certificates. However, it is not user-friendly when it comes to planning for transfer and evaluating transcripts. Even when creating education plans for local degrees and certificates, Edgenav at times does not validate the plans. For transfer and transcript evaluations, Edgenav does not recognize course requirements for four-year universities and coursework completed at other colleges and universities. To input such coursework into Edgenav becomes time consuming and does not make good use of time in counseling appointments. Um, from Jessica, Dr. Jessica Eaton, uh, this registration tool ha was never meant to be a degree audit program. Edgenav reps admitted this. The last five years have been an exercise in extreme frustration and futility while the campus directs their displeasure at counselors. Buying a software program piecemeal, which is what ABC does, not, let's not forget degree works, leads to hours upon hours of wasted effort and reduces our availability to meet with students. Now students have full access. Great, right? Sure, if you think it's great that the algorithm picks a course that is not a good fit for the declared major. Great at excluding students who plan to transfer, even those with a declared ADT major, business administration and transfer to CSUN, or who trans in credits from external institution. This money is better spent on Ad Astra, a scheduling tool that hopefully will set ABC on the right track for students to be able to complete their degrees in a timely manner by making sure that course selection offerings, course section offerings do not conflict with one another when considering major requirements outside a discipline, for example, math and economics. Uh, from Crystal Ibrahim. I have been a counselor at ABC for over seven years. I have previously provided feedback to the Edgenav development team for at least two years, so I am proficient with using the program. Since implementing its use on a broader scale at ABC, there has been more than one instance when Edgenav crashed during peak registration, despite the company's assurance that it could handle that kind of registration traffic. In a time when the campus community is working hard to increase enrollment, a failure of this sort works against our efforts. This is just one example of how Edgenav cannot properly support our student population. Along with many of my counseling colleagues, I do not support approval of the renewal agreement with Edgenav. Uh, from Tamira Palmetto de Spain, members of the board and President Zealot, my name is Tamira Palmetto and I am a co-chair for general counseling. I would like to express my concerns regarding the Edgenav program currently being used as a registration tool and degree auditing program at EVC. Edgenav will never function correctly until all areas of campus that need to support this program are in place. This computer program pulls data from the two-year schedule, which is so difficult to input for faculty that most have given up. Edgenav requires upfront evaluations to be completed admissions and trans uh, from admissions and transcripts offices and place on the ABC transcript for all outside transcripts and AP coursework. Students have been directed by Edgenav on multiple occasions to register for courses they do not need because they already completed the required courses at another institution or through AP credit. Further, Edgenav requires the manual inputting of each year's catalog in order to direct students to the correct courses based on their catalog year. The catalog for 23-24 was only recently completed well into the fall term, and that information was missing from Edgenav until very recently. This is important as many degree programs change from year to year, and incoming 23 freshmen may have received degree information that did not apply to them. In terms of ABC support, counseling has made major efforts working with Edgenav to make the program more accurate, but often due to class rotation rules or some other coding pro problem, our plans are not valid, quote unquote, in quotes. We as counseling faculty work with catalog rights, outside transcripts, AP credit, transfer, and student transfer and major prep, constantly changing directives and requirements from the state, and we know what courses a student needs to complete their program and transfer goals. It is quite frustrating to attend weekly Edgenav meetings where we are asked to address the quote-unquote tickets we submitted where the same issues are addressed repeatedly. 
possible solutions. One, more areas need to be involved and responsible for the correct functioning of EGENAV. A cross-functional team should be meeting with EGENAV, including academic affairs. Fix the two-year schedule so that faculty can easily input data. Get the data in there. Two, the catalog needs to be completed sooner and a paper copy needs to be distributed to areas that work with this tool as a daily hourly function of their job. Curriculum needs more support and more people to make this happen. Three, upfront evaluations need to happen for all outside transcripts and AP credit. And that credit must be added to the student's ABC transcripts. This is the only way Edgina will see those classes and credit. The last administration approved an additional three evaluators for this to happen. We need to stop telling students to take courses in EGENAV that, have, uh, that they've already taken. Number four, more IT support. EGENAV requires a full-time tech analyst to make updates, input catalog information, respond to issues as they come up. Currently, we have one tech analyst who splits their time between counseling, which has a lot of needs and work, and EGENAV. This just isn't sustainable or workable and, quite frankly, isn't reasonable. Please listen to the people who work with this program every day and consider our concerns before purchasing another five years. Thank you for your time and consideration. From Tawana Catley, EGENAV still gives inaccurate information to students. After six plus years of collaborative and exhaustive efforts to make the system work for AVC, it still causes harm to our students as students have already followed its guide and take incorrect classes. Counseling should be able to exercise quote unquote our academic freedom and choose not to use EGENAV as an advising tool. EGENAV does not and will not work at ABC until we have the staff of scribers, a degree audit system that talks to Banner, upfront transcript evaluation, up-to-date and regular updates of the two-year calendar and a recognizable disclaimer. Until all these are solidified, EGENAV academic plans harm students. <clears throat> um, and from me, Mesa Nicolás. Uh, counselors evaluate transcripts from prior colleges and have students who take multiple AP exams. It's endlessly frustrating that information regarding course usage and very specific notes that were once easily visible to both students and counselors are being eclipsed by this giant price tag and thorn in all of our sites. We paid so much for this program and it's been more than six years since its purchase. It isn't functioning the way it should because the infra infrastructure wasn't and still isn't in place for it to be successful. If a software program requires us to manipulate so many exceptions to make the plan work, then what's the point of having the program? Students are taking unnecessary classes and counselors are being put in a position where it appears like we put information on all plans. An actual example for business administration majors, the plan defaults to Math 124. However, if the student wants to attend Northridge, they need to take both Math 128 and 148. That means the student who took Math 124 because Edgenau's recommendation um, and couldn't see a counselor until after week two used their financial resources to take an, an, an unnecessary class. Not a good use of taxpayer money or the student's own financial resources. Additionally, EGENAV doesn't randomly populate general education classes. I've seen a handful of the same classes recommended consistently while many, many others are not. This is potentially harming not just our students, but also our classroom faculty across a variety of disciplines. EGENAV isn't all bad. It's a great visual aid for planning one single semester when it works and is accurate. But we can also make great visual aids in Canva, which would be a great investment. Additionally, I like the drag and drop function about EGENAV, but $840,666 seems pricey for dragging and dropping. As you know, the Counseling Matriculation Division served hundreds of students between July's RegFest and the first two weeks of classes. Us counselors are experts in our field, and we know what works and what doesn't, what doesn't especially after six years of testing an aggravating product. I generally hope this is not another instance of administrators and the board ignoring faculty recommendations. Thank you. I have a couple questions, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, first of all, I, I heard you mention, uh, thank you for, for reading all those, uh, first of all, Ben. I heard you mention that this product, uh, we've been using this product for over six years. Um, when, this, when this product was purchased for uh, ABC, did the um, counselors 
play a significant role in the decision making process that that this is a, a product that we would like to use? No, not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of. Okay. So um, I, I certainly am very concerned about it because as we, as we are trying to grow our enrollment here uh, with all of our beautiful new buildings and the programs that we offer, um, it's very frustrating. I, I think that we often do not approach things from the student standpoint or as, as, as you just explained, even from the faculty and the counselor standpoint, it's hard to get classes, period, sometimes. There are certain classes that are very difficult to get. But then if we're dealing with a program that tells, you know, is not always running at um, the capacity that we would want it to be running, that makes it, that's very frustrating for students. I can see faculty being, uh, and, and you, the counselors who are trying to direct our students in the right on the right path. So um, I'm assuming that should the board, and I have no idea what the vote will be, um, not renew this agreement for the next five years, do the counselors have a program in mind or a couple of them that they would like to um, venture into, let's say, piloting or or looking into to replace this program? From my memory, nothing specific as far as like purchasing a new software program. We have been using homegrown education planning templates over a very, very long time. So it was essentially um, uh, the templates that we've been using while EduNav has been worked on and, and being developed um, for our potential use um, was created based off of older templates that we use as like paper copies. Um, and it's a homegrown Excel sheet that has general education requirements, it has major requirements, and it, you're also able to put what students are required to take for other institutions that they're interested in transferring to as major prep. Um, and it's easily readable. Um, we're able to write notes and um, uh, and students can identify exactly what they're taking and why they're taking those classes, which EduNav does not allow for us to do. And that system sounds somewhat antiquated, you know, using Excel spreadsheets, okay. Um, I yeah. have a question. Um, how many people uh, sent in a public comment? How From many? what you read, how many people were? Eight. There were eight, eight, including myself. Eight, including yourself. Uh, Ms. Gaines had asked the question um, that I was interested in to know, because I know when you do the job every day, uh, you know what software probably works best. So I wanted to know if there were any recommendations from the counselors about that. Um, Dr. Zellett, when does the contract end? It expires. Uh, I was messaging with mm -hmm. the VP of Student Services, it expires soon. Um, and it, this is a compliance issue. Students have to have access to automated ed plans by, uh, by legislation. And yeah. so uh, this, this is an urgent issue. I, I hear everything that you're saying. Um, unfortunately, everything goes back to how when you introduce a software product, it's all about how you build it into your systems and the inclusion at that point and, and the rollout. And yeah, I, think I completely understand, yeah. but what we have is seven faculty members yes. saying it doesn't work. That matters to me. And I'm sorry that you feel that comments that are brought before the board are not heard because I swear I listen to everyone and try to understand their perspective. And I think most of the board does too. Thank you. I appreciate um, that. I, I do want to say, though, um, and this is not directed to the speaker. Um, first of all, then, it should have come to us before, should have been here sooner. These are my concerns. Um, if we know that, from what I'm hearing from the counselor, they're keeping Excel sheets as well as EduNav information. Um, the part that really turned me off was students taking the wrong classes. That's not acceptable. Um, now, one thing I do realize from a business perspective, if we don't renew a contract, 
nothing is in place, then we may not meet certain criteria. So I would say when it comes to academic things, academic issues, those uh, contract renewals should be brought a couple of months ahead of time so that maybe you can put together a, st a small committee of counselors and people who use the system so that you can get feedback about it, make some suggestions, do some research to see what's out there that will work. Yes, ma'am. I can, I can say that you know, I've been here since 2014, and okay. um, even when um, Dean Rogenstein was here, counseling has been very, very vocal about okay. all of this. Okay, thank you for telling me. A lot. Me <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we need something that works and we need the best product. And um, I hear you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Snow, I have a quick question for you because this particular action item in listening to what they are um, saying, um, and I realize that, um, that to not renew this and to we have a second semester enrollment coming up where you need to provide that online thing. But my question is, it, is it possible to perhaps renew for one year so that in the meantime, we're, we're out there assessing and uh, looking for a better replacement for our counselors and faculty to be able to do their job? And so we only have to put up with had you now for one more year just so we are in compliance. And that way we're meeting all the criteria and the compliance pieces. So um, this this item came up, Shami, through IT. So would you like to speak to the contract and to uh, the renegotiability of it, et cetera? Okay. We can definitely look into um, renewing for one year instead of five. Typically, the shorter length contracts are more expensive. Right, I will say a lot of time, dollars, energy has been invested here. I realize it was um, the process here, I believe, failed because there should have been buy-in and engagement with counseling, with student services at the front end so and that we didn't. technology, Mr. Barr. And technology has, yeah. has always, yeah, and technology. And technology was a part of the was a part of that conversation, but what we failed to do institutionally was get buy-in from from the end users, from counseling, and so that's really where um, where we could have made a, a a difference here. So the request here is the contract is in front of you. We can go back and look to see if there is a, a an option for a one year extension, but I will tell you that the amount of funds that we put into this, it is a system that with with proper development, um, with proper resources, with buy-in from the end users, it can work, it works at other places. I, I just wanna say that for me, it may be an issue of throwing good money after bad. Could have just been a bad choice. It, it, that could very much be, but any alternative might have us in the same position five years from now. Um, I'm certain. Yeah. If, so. if we do a one year approval for re doing this contract. I think it's very important that we bring the counselors in, yeah. to talk to the EDUNAV people, Absolutely. tell them where the problems are, yeah. and find out what the solutions are, so that a year from now, we know that everyone's on board, that those solutions are gonna be in place. Absolutely, Trustee Adams. Yep. And uh, Mr. Poirot, that may be your, the catalyst in, in uh, when you talk to EDUNAV, they may not like the one year that we're we're proposing to them, but you might want to share with them that we need this time right. to be able to see if this is um, doable and if our counselors can move forward, if we can get all the components in place to move forward to sign a five-year contract down the road. And if they're not willing to give you that one year. Yep. Um, and you can also let them know that a board member specifically said they've had six years to make everybody happy. Why am I hearing complaints today about a six-year product? Yep. Oh, absolutely. Either it works or it doesn't for them. Yep. And I can, I can tell you from, from my office, from, from the institution's perspective, when, when, when the system goes down during peak enrollment time, that's an issue for us. So you know, we're not in any way advocating that this is a perfect system. We know there's work that needs to be done. And we know conversations need to be had.
And I would, I would like the board to understand that this has not been ignored. Um, if Vice President Padron, if you would like to take just a minute or two, if the board is interested in hearing about the meetings that she has had, um, just, just talk about the communication with EduNav and some of the things that are in place. Thank you, members of the board. Um, since um, I've been meeting with the council group, uh, along with the, uh, several deans that uh, consist of weekly meetings, as the council ha have attested, we have been working diligently to. We have a current meeting um, coming up next week to look at, you know, the scribing issue, also the two-year um, catalog or. or um, uh, Ed educational plan that's in the system will also be removed so that would be an option for um, able for the counseling staff to be able to see things more clearly um, we have had yes a technician in the counseling division who has been doing both the scribing and as well as other counseling uh, duties we are in the process of also looking and thinking outside the box next week on how we could be able to ameliorate that um as you know, is at the table has been at the table we have met with them um, numerous times and i think that they're willing to work with um, our team to really um the, the other issue was a catalog you know scribing the catalog for the first time and we really launched this this um past spring semester and yes we did have issues when we first launched it. I think since then, we currently have over 10,000 students using the program to look at their classes. And I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I, I really um, thank the, the board for giving us the opportunity to continue to work with them um, if Edunav agrees to that one-year term and, and be able to continue to make this um, program work for us. Now, uh, a stat, a, um, a, Educational plan in that is very stagnant, that is not shared, is also not the solution. I believe that there needs to be trust from the counselors with EduNav and um, with everyone involved. And I think that we need to continue to work on those relationships and the expectations. Uh, but I think that I have had at no point in time EduNav really not want to uh, solve these um, issues. Well, thank you. I just believe that EduNav needs to build the trust. Yes. I mean, it's their product. If the counselors don't trust it, it's not on the counselors. Yes. It's on Edgenet or Navit, whatever it is. <laughs> Did I hear you say we just um, started using this product last we spring? It. We this launched This spring. It and this we've spring. had it for six years? Yes. And if, Excuse me? If I may, what? that is part of the challenge. That it, there were a lot of stops and starts, and it wasn't really until after I got here that we started talking about either use it or stop it, right? Because we're paying for a product that was halfway in development. And I think from my own experience launching products in an educational setting, if you don't implement it right from the start, the mm -hmm. frustration that grows over there's those years of mm -hmm. poor implementation make recovery very difficult. And I think yes. that that's where we are right now. I don't even know that if it's an issue of, is EduNav a good product? I think that there's years and years of frustration yes. of, of an implementation that, that didn't work. And I'm sure there's a whole host of reasons across the board why that implementation didn't happen the way that it might have been most helpful. Dr. Zellett, I have a quick question. Approximately yes, how many counselors do we have here at ABC? Did someone Is answer that? I want to say 30? Is that right? Counselors. 30? Um, no. Full-time, yes, but we have part-time counselors. Okay. How many um, full-time counselors? Let me break it down. I'm going to say about 30. 36 was a number that came to my 36. mind, but I haven't looked recently. I'm sorry? 15 to 20 full-time. OK. I and I think that we also hired um, some new um, counselors to help us with the um, uh, guided pathways um, model and to be able to um, help students. So yes, we could give that information back to you with more detail. Any more questions? Thank Any you. Other, thank you. OK, so for Ms. Gaines, I just have one question, if that's OK. So We've heard 19% of the uh, people who use this product disagree with it. Um, so I, I just think that's important. Yeah. 
show me what is the end date or okay okay board members I, I, uh, if you will agree I think we should um, not um, vote on 13.17 I think we should pull that and, and ask uh, Vice President Brar to perhaps <coughs> come back with a one-year contract because I I'm very concerned about this product agree I agree. agree. We all are in agreement, yes, Michael? Yes, Yeah. Okay, then we will pull 13.17 uh, for now. Okay. Okay. 13.18, um, approval of a three-year renewal agreement and order form for SARS software subscriptions with Valsoft Corporation doing business as SARS software products through June 30th, 2026. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, uh, <coughs> Madam President. Uh, at the conclusion of this item, uh, could we have a five to ten minute break? Um, <coughs> five minutes. You have to stand up, stretch yeah. a little bit. Okay. Uh, Thank yes, you. sir. Okay. Um, so, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay. We will take a um, five minute break. Stand up a little bit.
sorry. We will resume at 10.53. All right, action item 13.19, approval of three-year renewal agreement for Smarter Measure Software Assessment Tool with Smarter Services, LLC, through August 31st, 2026. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. 13.20, approval of technology services agreement between Precision Campus Corporation and Antelope Valley Community College District to provide online query tools for the district. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. 13.21, approval of master services agreement between Course Maven Incorporated doing business as dualenroll.com and Antelope Valley College for software from October 1st, 2023 to September 30th, 2025. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Well, quickly, President Gaines, I at some point want to know what these different software programs, how they tie into each other, how they support one another. So because I see this as DBA dualenrollment.com, so I know it has something to do with enrollment. Um, so we, we really need an overview of, of these products that are being used so that we are not wasting money on things that we wouldn't need if something else worked correctly. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. 13.22, approval of three-year renewal contract for the district's campus-wide chatbot with Career America LLC doing business as Ocelot. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? <clears throat> Aye. Aye. 13.23, approval of service agreement with Schools First Federal Credit Union and Antelope Valley Community College for automated teller machines. Uh, any, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Madam President. I, I read the contract uh, for these uh, ATM machines. Uh, I didn't see where we're being compensated for allowing them on campus. And also, were any of the other financial institutions offered the opportunity to put their ATM uh, machines on campus? Um, thank you for the question, sir. Uh, briefly, this is a renewal of a contract. Schools First was here prior to the pandemic and the campus closure. And I believe it was around that time when nobody was really on campus for a while that the two machines got pulled. We do not receive benefit because it's a service to our students and our employees to be able to access cash instead of having to get in their cars and try and drive somewhere to get money. So it's a service to our students. Well, are there any of the other banks offered the, up? were they informed that they could do it? No, sir, they were not. Because Schools First offers um, free banking services to our staff and our students, and they're a, 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 a partner with us. They don't charge us. Those ATMs are free to use for our students, right? So so we've continued that, that relationship with them. Um, we are not making any money off of this, but they are providing an ATM here um, at, in the cafeteria, one in Uhazy, and there's uh, there's a desire for one at the Palmdale campus as well because it is really something that benefits the students. But if you don't have a, a, one of their cards, are you going to be charged a service fee to use them? I don't believe that any, I believe, I don't want to misspeak here, but my understanding is, is that credit union, other ATM cards from other credit unions are not charged a fee, but I can get back to you. But they are, all students get a free account, all employees get a free account. And so it, it really is a no-cost checking account. Well, we're so. not really sure whether if you go with Wells Fargo card, you can use it in their you can, Well, you are going to charge a fee for a private bank, but you are also going to pay Wells Fargo fees for having that account, right? Right. And so, sir, that's the same if, if with the ATM machine were on our campus or at the mall or at the gas station. Those are external things that are not in our purview to control. Well, I appreciate the convenience to the students, but I'm, the free I cost. fear that they're going to be soaked with fees 
And, you know, they're not, they're not in business to like us. They're in business to make money. Right. Schools First is a credit union, I believe. I believe it's a nonprofit, right? Uh, so they're they're not in. Yeah, it's a nonprofit organization. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Thirteen point twenty four, approval to utilize the Sourcewell piggyback agreement and Procore Incorporated for the district's exercise and fitness solution needs. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Board members, uh, if you will allow me, I'd like to chunk 13.25 through 13.35. They all deal with measure AB. Uh, if that is, uh, if you're okay with that, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. Yes, uh, Madam President, 13.25. Uh, temporary uh, restrooms you know I thought when we made a contract with uh, one of the companies to build buildings that it was their duty to provide trailers and restrooms how did we get into having to provide trailers for them and restrooms does anybody, does anybody know that We provide the restrooms for the construction sites uh, rather than pay an additional fee to have it done by the contractors. I'm looking into doing that on future contracts where it's bid into the general, the general contractor's contract. As far as the trailers, the trailers are provided because it's part of the contract agreement with the CMs and with the inspectors that we provide the, the, the trailers for them as part of their, their overall PAA agreement. Well, is it cheaper for us to do it than put it in the contract for them to do it? Uh, if it's in their contract, you're going to pay for what the amount of the trailer is, plus probably 15, 20% in additional fees. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, those action items pass. Okay, hey, reports and announcements, uh, Academic Senate, Mr. Hal Huntsman, is he here? Uh, Hal is uh, teaching, as faculty do, so he left this and asked that I read it. Good morning, Board of Trustees. I apologize for having to leave early, but my class starts at 10.30 a.m. and our students have to come first. This is the end of week eight, pretty much exactly halfway through our fall semester. As you would expect, faculty and students in full-term courses are in the midst of midterms, papers, and supporting the success of our students. At the same time, for many other courses, today marks the end of the first eight-week term, and next week begins the second eight-week term for the semester. Though all subjects do not lend themselves to the format, for those that do, short-term classes provide the flexibility that many students ask for and allow them to focus on one or two classes at a time while still completing more courses per semester. This is good, both, stu both students and the college. Despite some recent controversy, the poker process is also good for both students and the college, and AVC faculty have worked hard to make it possible. The college needed to be poker certified in order to review our courses and give them a quality review badge. Having more quality badged courses makes AVC courses more visible to students around California and therefore increases the overall enrollment rate at AVC. In addition, instructors who go through the poker process gain incredibly valuable experience and the opportunity to make their courses better, not only by aligning it to the CVC OEI rubric, but also by providing students a better experience in online learning. AVC faculty responded to this need in record time. Starting in December 2022, six AVC faculty became poker certified reviewers by completing an intensive four-week training process. They then reviewed their first three courses developed by AVC faculty and helped revise them to the poker standards. The college's certification process was complete in approximately three months when most colleges take six months to a year, garnering kudos from the state designers team. In March 2023, the call for submissions was sent out and 175 courses were submitted for poker review. Fortunately, by April, three more reviewers joined the team and though work slowed during the crush of the end of the semester, the team continued to review courses throughout the summer. The review process is demanding and often involves several revisions. 
I'm very proud of my colleagues for the work that they have done and continue to do for our college and for our students. It is my sincere hope that we can find a way to continue the poker review and revision process. AVC faculty want to make our college better and our students more successful. Flexible term links and poker certification are just two of the ways we are working for these goals. Thank you, Harold. Thank you. Um, hey, Antler Valley College Federation of Teachers, Dr. Jason Barton. Good morning again. I'd like some clarification if someone could provide it to me. How many minutes do I have to give a report? I know it's three minutes for uh, public comments, but I don't know how long it is for the report. I believe it's typically three minutes. If okay. The report would be okay for that. Give it a presentation. Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, I appreciate all of the work that everyone uh, does here. Uh, despite, you know, my comments, I respect all of you tremendously uh, in the work you do, and we do share a lot of common ground. Uh, however, you know, I feel it's important to address matters of, of criticism. So, uh, in, in my opinion, the General Counsel's Office, the Leadership in Human Resources, with the support of President Zillette, remain punitive. Uh, despite the call to be kind, let's find a way to agree. We were reading the four agreements last year, last fall. Uh, there's still, it, it appears, very little desire on the part of the administration to say yes in circumstances where there should be a clear yes. Uh, there's little to no spirit from our observation to ensure that employees have everything they need to do their jobs. Uh, even when there's a clear incentive, for example, complying with the collective bargaining agreement, complying with Americans with Disabilities Act Title I, uh, there's, there's efforts that I observe to circumvent uh, the, the, the written agreements and laws. They want to get around the laws. Uh, and, and, and let alone, I mean, so there's, a, there, there's no desire to say yes, let alone when it's a good idea to exercise restraint when the district does have the legal right and it's clear that you know they could pursue say a termination rather than look at a situation and say well the offense isn't that severe we can terminate the employee but we're going to give the employee another chance that was not done in a situation where the offense was not that severe and where I have observed more severe behavior amongst administrators and the toleration of the sort of behavior that t employees are terminated for, for administrators. Um, so, you know, uh, here's an example. So it's one thing to, to, to state, you know, what I, what I said, but then there's evidence of, of this spirit. So the POCA program was initiated in the spring, uh, beginning of spring. I'm having a hard time getting this to... All right, this is taking some time. Okay, here was the original offer, and this was offered by the college. This wasn't offered you know, by faculty to faculty, it was offered by the college. ABC is offering faculty a monetary incentive to have their online courses evaluated through the peer online course review process. Faculty who complete all of the following requirements will be eligible for a $4,000 stipend for each course that is submitted for evaluation where all reviewer recommendations are addressed. So that was prior, at the beginning of spring, prior to February. May I have two more minutes? Thank you. At the beginning of fall, administration then put a pause on the program and halted payments uh, for work that was completed. And the reason given was now all of a sudden there's a need for an agreement with the faculty union. At the beginning of fall, this was after all of this work had been done. After deliberating, we determined that there was no need for 
in MOU or an agreement. And so what we did after discussing it is we, we began the grievance process and agreed to a resolution following a meeting regarding uh, that particular grievance. Last week or the week prior, there was a new development in which it was stated that the payments were going out. So from the union perspective where this is a grievance matter, the matter is now resolved. And so we declared the matter resolved, which was within our rights. There is a lengthy email that I provided to all faculty. I recommend that the board read that particular email that I wrote. Dr. Lauren Helsper replied with, with, with her take on the matter. And I just want to read one sentence in that email, and I recommend that all of the board members read that email. It was sent to all faculty. This summarizes everything. The, 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 the perspective and the attitude that administration has when attempting to resolve matters such as this, where the offer was made by the district and the faculty did the work. This is the statement. It's a doozy of a statement. Rather than withhold compensation from our faculty for work completed in accordance with the program guidelines, the district is choosing to properly compensate affected employees. I think that speaks for itself. Thank you. Next speaker, um, Antelope Valley College Federation of Classified Employees, Pamela Ford. Hello, Oops, hello again. I have to start by saying my dean, Dr. Rashida Elise Brown, nailed the introduction and narrative for Dr. Angela Davis. And I have to say, that outfit, I'm just saying, it was fantastic. It was unspeakably empowering to have activist Angela Davis at our campus. So thank you, Dr. Zellett, Dean Riley Dwyer, and Director Vanessa Escobar, and Board of Trustees, oops, I hate these things, okay. And Board of Trustees, and anyone else who was involved in bringing this all together. Though there was consternation about her as an individual and an obvious interest in controlling the narrative in anticipation of the direction the conversation may have gone, all that angst was without cause. She did not disappoint. She spoke with dignity, elegance, and grace. And as she shared her views and perspectives, it was an experience that made me proud to be an advocate for others. What fascinates me most is her overwhelming humility, the idea expressed in her honest embarrassment of her face on a t-shirt and her realization that it wasn't about her, it was about the person wearing the t-shirt and the empowerment it gave them to do what they needed to do to navigate their path and to dominate their struggles. Her worldview is so much broader than the narrow-mindedness of those diametrically opposed to her. And she utilizes her position to help others, to empower, to protect our environment, and to pursue human rights. Although judged harshly by some, because they can't get past what happened before, and they've given no thought to the injustice that she faced, She's not resentful nor judgmental. She looks to the future and what others will do to improve the world. My hope is that she will be asked back again and that she simply this time can speak to us because there is much to gain from her experiences. I was anticipating a lecture from her and I'm hoping that all groups if, will, if willing will stand to all groups of willing to hear her will stand to benefit from her knowledge. She had a lot to impart, and I thought that this was a real benefit to our campus. And as I said about Ms. Huerta, I think that we need to continue this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Uh, confidential Management Supervisory Administrator 
employees, Ashley Hawkins. Good morning, trustees, Dr. Zellett, Ms. McClure, and guests that are listening. I also want to issue congratulations to Dean Dwyer, Director Escobar, and the entire equity team for creating such a groundbreaking event yesterday. Professor Angela Davis's presence was a true testament to our institution's commitment to equity, not just in words, but in action. Thank you for your leadership in making this event possible. I am also pleased to see that equity is being woven <coughs> excuse me, into everything that we do as an institution. This is a refreshing development and I am confident that it will continue to lead to a more inclusive environment for all. I would like to also extend my congratulations to Dr. Elise Brown for her introduction, Dr. Zellett for moderating the conversation so eloquently, and creating such a dynamic conversation between three influential female leaders, bringing focus to how much that matters. Rep representation truly does matter. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the positive impact of the mobile workforce on campus. It really has created cross-departmental partnerships that would have otherwise not been possible. We see folks from business services interacting with student services and academic affairs. Relationships are forming and um, collaboration happening where maybe it wouldn't have otherwise. Overall, we are so pleased as a group with the progress that we're making as an institution, and we're confident that we are well positioned to continue to achieve our goals and serve our students at the highest level. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have our ASO president here, Mr. Benitez? No. No. Okay. Okay. Antelope Valley College Foundation, Ms. Diane Knipple. Good morning. It's Friday. Happy Friday. Casual Friday, as I like <laughs> to say. <laughs> Um, just two things of note, I really did want to use uh, this opportunity to let you know and let the college know who may be listening that this is the time of year we are offering our um, uh, faculty grant program. Email has gone out. Um, you can call my office, uh, any of my staff. Um, it's a one-time thing. It's not for recurring activities, but it's a great opportunity. We have money to give. I want to give money. So please uh, put your application in in a timely manner. It's due really pretty much the middle of November, I believe. And then in November coming up, uh, we are preparing for Giving Tuesday month. Technically, it's a national day, but we run it all month. And this year, not only are we supporting the pantry, which we've done in the past, the past three years, we've raised $64,000 for the pantry. Yay, thank you for all those who have donated. Um, this year, we're expanding into the full basic needs and potentially even club programs or other types of um, activities that may have some ability to collect some donations from the staff and faculty. So appreciate your efforts. Uh, uh, Trustee Harvey, I'm so glad to see you back. Um, I'm glad you're here and, and continued success for your recovery. Thank Di you. Diane, I have a quick question for sure. you. I know uh, I may be uh, out of somewhat out of line here, but I just wanted to ask you, I know that the foundation primar primarily is, um, raises funds for scholarships, et cetera, for our students here on the campus. But I was wondering, if, if is there anything or is there any way the foundation or the college could in some manner or another support this, the um, Space Museum out at Edwards Air Force Base? They're really struggling to to raise uh, the money that is needed to encompass the walls of that. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've probably um, uh, heard the- Actually, I'm a donor of that as well. Oh. <laughs> a flight test historical flight foundation test member. Historical, yeah. Yes, um, Mr. Art Thompson, I know yes. is out raising a lot of money. I just wondered, is there any way that as a college, I don't expect us to give our money, but is there anything that we can do that perhaps would support that project because I think it's it would really bring a lot of um, people to our valley and it would be a, a worthwhile endeavor if we could support somehow. I'm not sure of that, and I don't expect you to give me an answer now. I'll just give you a thought. Um, so um, monetarily, we really can't do that, right? They have their own 501c3 and they're raising money. In, in fact, um, Art and his team um, are getting very close to the goal. 
Um, they are finding some um, anonymous donors of wealth that are really helping the program. I happened to talk to him last week, so I'm, thank you, Art, if you're listening. <laughs> um, so, but they still do need additional funds. I think where the college could help would be in the future when it is completed, that we have an opportunity to do some teaching and some learning um, as, as part of their lecture series as it comes forward to fruition. We may even want to think about having a booth or something uh, that would be there to recognize the, the uh, capabilities that we have to support the aerospace industry. Just a thought. Thank you. These are great ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Office of the President. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for meeting this morning. Uh, before I dive into my prepared comments, I actually agree with Dr. Bowen that the board should read the entirety of Dr. Elon Helsper's email. Um, I dare say that I could choose one sentence out of anyone's email in this room and make it sound inflammatory. Good morning, President Gaines, trustee, and our student trustee. From the second week of fall 2023, our plans for the semester were shaken by the sudden emergency closure of the admin building shortly followed by that of the hub. It was no small feat swiftly relocating 70 plus employees, reconnecting computers so folks could continue to work, rekeying buildings so we could guarantee secure operations. But we at ABC dug deep and actively chose to work together to guarantee service to our students and our community. Some of these repairs are taking longer than expected, but I intend that we will do things right rather than do things in a hurry. When we move back into our spaces, they will be safe and complete. And I thank everyone who continues to actively choose collaborative problem solving and patience as time marches on. And I encourage all of us to remember that these inconveniences, inconveniences are indeed a first world problem. There are many things to share about how ABC is actively choosing service for our students in our community. Through educational opportunities like yesterday's discussion with Dr. Angela Davis, the upcoming and newly revived ABC Film Festival on October 13th and 14th, and our first official institutional recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day, ABC models critical thinking, appreciation of the arts, and cultural awareness. I thank the faculty, classified professionals, administrators, and you as our board for supporting these events and making them possible. Uh, I want to thank Dean Dwyer. She gave uh, very quickly some preliminary statistics for the attendance yesterday. Between 75, 70 and 75% of the attendees were students. So the definite beneficiaries from Dr. Davis's, Professor Davis's presentation was absolutely our students. We also had um, from, and these stats come just from our Google responses. There were 230 responses initially, far more than that attended. Um, about 20% were faculty, um, about 9% were classified professionals, and then about 7% were community members, and then the smaller pieces of the pie. These are the preliminary numbers, and we can report attendance statistics, but this shows that our community, our college, and our students definitely benefit. I gleaned several jewels from Prof Professor Davis's discussion yesterday, and I'd like to share these. She said, your quest for social justice must be done through that which fulfills you. She said, unity does not require us to become someone else. She said, education teaches young people how to imagine worlds that do not yet exist. She said, it is only through the process of education that we learn what we do not know. She said, our world of ideas would be richer if work were done collaboratively. Her encouragements and admonitions are to be taken seriously. There is value in unity that is worth the constant struggle to achieve it. I will continue to extend the invitation to the ABC community to make the difficult yet worthwhile choice of unity and collaboration. Our students and community deserve for us to look beyond arguments rooted in privilege and do the work that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> Sarlo. Um, board member comments. There's nothing today. Nope. Mr. Adams. I'm happy to see the Anno Valley Film Festival returning after a hiatus of several years. And I was a squeaky voice for many of those years <laughs> to bring it back. And I was privileged to be a judge for 
almost 40 films that were submitted from, uh, I believe, about 10 countries. And only the best of the best is going to be uh, shown next Friday and Saturday. And I would appreciate uh, as many people showing up as possible so that this can continue to be an annual event at Animal Valley College and uh, bring us a lot of uh, recognition uh, in the theater arts uh, realm. Um, and one final comment. Uh, I've been on the board a long time. I've gone through nine, I just counted them, nine interim and permanent presidents, and about 30 to 35, maybe even 40 vice presidents during the time I've been on the board. I could not be happier with our president and with our administrative staff at this point in time. I believe they are supportive of faculty and staff, and they do everything they can to ensure student success, and I thank them for their jobs. Ms. Harvey. No comment today. None? Well, we're, we're, we are glad to have you back and nice to see you Thank recovering. You. Um, you. I just want to say to Dean Dwyer and the equity team, I, I really enjoyed, I, I don't get to attend everything, but I, I made it a point to get here yesterday because I wanted to hear Dr. Davis and um, had the privilege of, of uh, chatting with her for a brief minute um, in the back. And I, I shared with her that as an educator, the one thing that every time I hear someone speak, I try to walk away gaining something. Uh, you know, there's something that I, I walk out the door with that I did not have perhaps when I walked in and she, she talked uh, frequently through her, through in answering uh, Dr. Uh, Zealot's questions yesterday, who I thought, by the way, did a phenomenal job. Kudos to you. You were amazing um, as the narrator. <coughs> and um, um, But she talked a lot about kids questioning and about not just students, but adults calling things into question. And so as I left yesterday, I, I thought, as an educator of TK-12 students, what can I do better to encourage my students to not accept the status quo, but to constantly call things into question? So as I was driving home, um, and even throughout the evening, I, I'm thinking a lot about that. So thank you, uh, Dean Dwyer. Uh, I thought it would. I thought she was amazing, and uh, that was something I just wanted to share. And our next board meeting will be November the thirteenth. Back to our regular Monday evening board board meeting. So, at this time, we will adjourn at eleven twenty-seven. <laughs>